Everybody's at different stages in this learning game of the Great Awakening because we're all waking up across the country. This is a biblical thing. Nobody made it up, at least not on this earth anyway. But uh, we know exactly what's going to go on, approximate time frames of what's going to happen. And right now we're in a, an exciting time to be alive. The, this is a war between good and evil. It's also a war between we the people and the Bar Association. The Bar Association is a cause of the vast majority of problems we have in America and the world. They own and control everything. I got a, a good friend, he's fairly young. His name is Justin. And Justin sailed through high school. He has the ability to read and retain every word, every page, every page number. Look it up later, know where it is, what book it came out of, who wrote it. Just blows my mind, his level of competency. Two years of law school and he got a doctorate after high school. Probably one of the youngest attorneys I've ever seen. Passed the bar on his first try with an 800 score. Nobody does that. And he went to work for one of the largest law firms in Seattle. And at his celebration party, they rented the Space Needle for a celebration party for the night. So the entire law firm had it. They had dinner and then Justin's standing there and he's looking out the windows at the city lights of Seattle. And the main partner of the law firm walked up and put his arm around Justin. And he said, what do you see out there? Do, do, who, who do you think controls all of that? We've got some of the largest companies in the world. We've got Microsoft and Amazon and Boeing right here in Seattle. Who do you think controls those? Who do you think controls the little mom and pop stores down there on the pier in downtown? Who do you think controls the state of Washington's government and all the little municipalities and the, and the county governments? Who do you think controls all that? And Justin proceeded to say, well, we the people elect our representatives and they control government and the CEOs make the decisions for the corporations. And the leading law partner let out a big old belly laugh and he, <laughs> he says no. Not one CEO, not one legislator makes a decision. Not one invoice, not one piece of sales literature, not one contract is written by any of them. They're written by us. They don't make a decision without running it past their legal department. We, the Bar Association, makes the decisions that run the world. And Justin looked him in the eye, shook his hand, and said, I quit. <laughs> and now he's helping the people with the law. He tore his bar card up and he walked out and he threw it away. Okay. I'm really proud of him. Over the years, I've probably got 20 or 30 attorneys to tear up their bar cards. And I've got judges that help us. Because they understand, once I've taught them the basics, that they didn't know what the law was. They didn't know its origin. They didn't know what it came from. If I was to ask you, where did the law come from? What's its origin? How did we arrive at this thing called law where a small group of men could put something down on paper and try and hold me, a man, accountable? Could you answer that question? You watched my video, okay. <laughs> no, actually it wasn't. It was Genesis 1, 26 through 28. God gave me man dominion over the land, the air, and the water 
and this is law. The land became common law, common to all mankind. It's property, it's equity, it's rights. It's our rights, they're unalienable. What does unalienable mean? They cannot place a lien upon our rights. That's what it means. Those rights are unalienable. It has to do with things of property nature. Patents and grants and securities. Gold and silver. Commodities. Things we own. Right? Things we own. That's what common law is. It deals with properties and it deals with our rights. The air which is the highest form of law. The air is above the land, which is above the water. The air is ecclesiastical or canon law, which is trust law. All things held in trust, held in the benefit of another, are heirs. It's trust law. That's all it is. In Genesis 1.26 through Genesis 2.25 is a trust indenture. Why did God start that off right in the very beginning of the Bible? He put the world under trust to mankind. We're the trustees. He's the executor. He placed it to us to manage for the benefit of our beneficiaries, our future heirs, for generations to come. Lives on in perpetuity forever. And what is the definition of forever? until the end of the earth. Forever is till the end of the earth. Then we're in eternity, okay? So it lives on in perpetuity forever. The jurisdiction of the water is admiralty law. It is commerce. It's contract law. Things held in contract with another. Now, there's some interesting elements to a, a true contract that a, the Bar Association doesn't want to teach you. The Bar Association teaches you there's got to be an agreement, consideration, and both people have to sign, and you've got a contract. Well, that's not true. There's eight elements of a contract, okay? But one of the most important of those elements is a contract has to be between like kind. Can a man write a contract with a man? Yes. And when I use the word man today, that means mankind, not being gender specific, it's mankind. It's our species. Okay, so a man can have a contract with a man, but a corporation has to have a contract with a corporation. Can a man have a contract with a corporation? No. Can't. It's like kind versus like kind. Why did they put things in corporations? Anybody know? Why did they start doing that? Later liability. Or limit the liability just to that corporation so that the people who are in the corporation not okay. steward only the assets of the corporation. You're you're exactly right. It's to limit liability. So if a man has integrity, purpose, knows all eight elements of a contract and writes a proper contract where there's a meeting of the minds, there's full and honest disclosure of the terms and conditions of the contract, there's equal consideration where one person gives something up and one receives, and the other gives something up and the other receives. It has to be a two-way street. If that's true, why do they have to form corporations? No, I'm, I'm serious. The reason is, is because of lack of integrity. If we had integrity, we'd never need a corporation. If we were honest, we'd never need a corporation. Corporations exist so that people can take, be taken advantage of. Yeah, because they have no integrity. So that's a, that's a pretty sad thing. Um, and one of the main things we got to learn is the United States of America 
is not the same thing as the United States. It's not the same thing as USA Inc. Salt Lake County is not the same thing as the county of Salt Lake. Salt Lake City is not the same thing as Salt Lake City Incorporated. Okay? You are not the same thing as your all caps name. So my name, David Lester Strait, spelled in all capital letters, is not the same as David Lester Strait in upper and lower case. What happened is a vessel was created. A vessel. And the law clearly talks about vessels over and over and over again. Why am I talking so much about law? <laughs> it's because kindergarten through 12th grade, how many law classes did you have? Why? That's right. The moment you turned 15 years old and got a permit to operate a motor vehicle that you didn't even need, you've been dealing with the law. And yet, you never had any classes. They teach you algebra. How much algebra have you used since you got out of high school? <laughs> no, most people haven't. Okay? So they teach us things we don't necessarily need and leave out the things that we do. I thought it was a government-funded, government-controlled curriculum, government school system. At some point in time, somebody's got to take responsibility for our education. Who's that going to be? I don't think it should be. It should be our parents. You know, it really should. Our parents are responsible. That's one of the reasons I feel so lucky. I had great parents, and they taught me to question authority. Now, that my school that I went to told me not to question authority. So in my early days, my parents went in one ear and out the other, and the school sunk in, and I obeyed authority in the early days. Okay? And that always gets you into trouble. So, what city are we in? Riverton? So if the city of Riverton police drove in right now, who are they? Do you know? Well, that's right. It says policy on the side of their car. Police is policy. They're policy enforcement agents. It doesn't say law enforcement. It's policy. Supreme Court of the United States says rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. They're not law. They're corporate bylaws. They're for employees of the corporation to follow. So are you an employee of the corporation of the city of Riverton? Unfortunately, <laughs> Not for this discussion. Okay. You're not. But you are, because you consented. And what I mean by that is you volunteered and you call yourself. You self-determine. Your very first foundational cornerstone unalienable right is your right of self-determination. The church teaches it as free agency, right? That's the right to self-determine what's right, what's wrong. <clears throat> so you self-determine that you're a citizen, a person, and a resident. And if you are, you need CPR because you're dead. dead. You're a dead entity. You ever heard the term, all are equal in the law? Rich or poor, black or white, y'all have equal standing? Things like that? It's because you're all dead. What is an indictment? An indictment's a true bill. It says that right at the bottom of every indictment. It's a bill, it's an invoice. Did you bother to ask how much is the bill if you were indicted? No, nobody does. So you're brought up on charges. You don't pay the charges, you're asked to bond. 
If you don't pay the bond, your body is held as surety for the bond. Well, they collect from your SESTA QV trust that you don't even know you have. Do you understand those are all banking terms? So what is a court? Look up the word court in a legal dictionary. It says C bank, C post office. If you look up the word judge, it says C banker, C postmaster. Everything is banking. Do you know you have a 72 hour right of rescission on everything? You get a ticket from a police officer and he gives you a ticket for speeding down the road, you can rescind that ticket within 72 hours. So I didn't ask, do we have any police officers in the room? Any attorneys? Any government agents? That's a shame. I wish you guys had some of those around because I'd love to debate them for just a little bit. I take a red Sharpie and at a 45 degree angle, I write your offer to contract is not accepted while traveling in private in my private automobile. You operate under Title 18, Section 241 and 242 as a conspiracy to deprive me of my rights under the color of law. And I mail it back in. Here's some case law. Operation of a motor vehicle upon public streets and highways is not a mere privilege, but is a right or liberty protected by the guarantees of federal and state constitutions. The use of the highways for the purpose of travel and transportation is not a mere privilege, but a common and fundamental right of which the public and the individual cannot be rightfully deprived. No state government entity has the power to allow or deny passage upon the highways. Transporting his vehicles and personal property for either recreation or business, travel is not a privilege that can be permitted at will with forced insurances, registration, or licensing, but a common and fundamental right of liberty granted by the Constitution. Okay. Where can we find that? The use of the automobile, I got pages and pages and pages. I carry a folder in my pickup like this that is about that thick. and no cop can argue with it. It's got Supreme Court decisions, it's got case law, it's got everything. What is case law, by the way? Hard to determine cases. Like no, nah, it's the opine, the opinion of a judge. It's somebody's opinion. You understand no matter what side of the fence you're on or what subject you're arguing about, you can find case law that supports your opinion, okay? What do attorneys get taught in law school? Case law, case law, case law, case law. That's it. I proved to attorneys before that they didn't learn the law in law school. See, there's three types of law. There's superior law, supreme law, and corporate bylaws. That's it. S supreme law is laws given to us by God. They're unalienable. Okay, there are the Ten Commandments and more. It's not just ten, guys. That's just the most important ones. <laughs> okay, they're unalienable. Supreme law, and the whole reason we have state and federal supreme courts, is our constitutions and our treaties. Those are supreme laws. The purpose of the supreme court is to see if a lower court decision conforms to the constitutions and treaties of the United States of America. That's their only job. When they, the Supreme Court hears a case, and by the way, you got a 5% chance of getting a case before the Supreme Court. 5%, that's it. Out of all the ones that submitted, only 5% get heard. But their only job is to see if the decisions of the lower courts conform to our constitutions and treaties. Do you know that's we the people's job? It's not up to them. We're supposed to nullify them. We're supposed to nullify them <clears throat> through our juries and we're supposed to nullify them every time we get a letter in the mail that's addressed to our all caps name. When you get a letter in the mail, you have a 72 hour right to rescind. To correct the errors our public servants make, 
and to educate them so they don't do it again. That's your job. That's all of our jobs. And you know what we haven't done the last 100 years? We haven't corrected any of their errors. They make these tremendous, they call clerical errors, and we don't correct them, then we acquiesce. Government operates through the consent of the governed. What does that mean? That means they presume something. Let's see if you guys can see this. They presume something. They assume something. They get your tacit agreement that you're a citizen, person, and a resident, so you need CPR. And then they use hearsay to convict you, put you in jail, charge you a fine or a fee or a tax or whatever it may be. They say it's to tax the poor which might not otherwise be taxed. So they lead you down a path. They railroad you. What is the legal definition of the term railroad? To lead someone down a narrow path or rail to a predetermined outcome or conclusion. Predetermined. How do I know it's predetermined? I'll tell you my best confirmation of it. About five years ago, in the 9th District Federal Courthouse in front of Judge Mosman, the lead judge of the 9th District, which was known as the most liberal district of our federal courts, I brought a case. And the case I brought was basically there was a grandmother who was found guilty before I met her by a jury. She was tried and found guilty of four felony counts of fraud. She did nothing wrong, nothing. But they spent four days in a trial railroading her and then gave her half a day to defend herself and denied all of her witnesses denied all of her evidence, what's she gonna do then? Don't you have a right to defend yourself? Don't you have a right to efface your accusers? They didn't care. They said, basically told her she had no rights. She couldn't bring the Constitution up in the courtroom. They did the same thing to Shauna Cox and Ryan Bundy, and the Bundys. They said, don't bring that Bible into the courtroom. Don't bring that constitution into the courtroom. Why did they say that? No, it's because you're not a party to it. Did you know that? Did you get, know that you guys aren't a party to the Bible and you're not a party to the constitution? What does that mean? Ah, I'm about to tell you. Give me just a moment. So let me finish with Judge Mosman for a minute. What I proved with Judge Mosman is that there's two governments. That there's a de jure government of we the people, where we the people lay down the law and a government steps outside of their scope and authority of the law in which we the people lay down, then they're committing felonies. They're committing emoluments violation, okay? That's Article 1, Section 6, Clause 8 of the Constitution, an emolument violation. What is an emolument? Anybody know? It's where we pay them to do something that we lay down, that we tell them what to do, and they act outside of that scope and authority, and they collect a fee from us. It's not part of their job description. <laughs> it's not part of the law in which we lay down and they act outside of that. Therefore, they commit emolument violations. They're stealing from us, from the public, that they're getting paid by to do something we didn't tell them to do. 
or didn't give them authority to do. That's what an emolument violation is. I also proved that judges and prosecutors get a net retention or a commission for finding someone guilty. A commission. And I also proved that they share that with the defense attorney. For a guilty verdict. Now, what is a guilty verdict? What is a guilty verdict? What do they do when they arraign you? They want you to plead guilty or not guilty. Really? Did you know those are both commercial terms? Guilty and not guilty is both commercial terms. Did you know that in, on property, on land, industrial, commercial, and residential are all commercial terms? Who owns a house? No, you don't. <laughs> you don't own your house. The state owns your house. They can do anything they want with it. You know why? Because the county came along with a bunch of people who were compartmentalized legal idiots, and they stole your property on behalf of the state from you, and you didn't correct the errors, so therefore you acquiesced. I was telling you about Ken Cromer house was foreclosed on by the court. Kicked out of his house. He lived with somebody else. The, through the mercy of someone else, he lived, him and his wife lived for 10 months somewhere else. And I got him back into his house. How did I do that? I helped him get his land back in land, under the original land patent and accept the grant deed and no government can Deny that or kick you out of your home if you own your property. It's called a superior title. S superior title. How do you get your superior title? What's that? How do you get your superior title? Well, that's later on in the class. Okay. <laughs> See, most people have a warranty deed, and a warranty deed is called an abstract of title. I used to own 20% of a title company, and I didn't know this when I owned it. Yeah. Had a real estate company, two mortgage companies, a building supply company, three development companies, a construction company with 96 employees. I had a specialty building supply company at one time. I was doing pretty well. And I didn't know all this, so they took it away from me. Took everything away from me. Sure, sure. Did you know all mortgages in the United States are fraud? Every one of them. Everyone is fraud. Did you know your mortgage was paid off? Your mortgage was paid off the moment you signed the mortgage application and they accepted it. You know who paid it off? You did. See, you're not a debtor, you're a creditor. You just don't know it. You don't know it. They want you to think you're a debtor and that you're indebted to them. Your signature paid off that loan immediately. And you don't know why, do you? Okay, I'm gonna teach you guys why. I'm giving you, what I'm doing right here is I'm, it's called a tease. I'm teasing you with a lot of little things that we're gonna cover later in depth. Okay, but I'm trying to wake you up right now. Wake you up to things you don't know. But you can go through this whole thing, and it's case law, supreme case law, everything, of why you don't need a driver's license to drive. Okay, now there are three cases where you do need a driver's license. When you're hauling passengers for hire. Are you an Uber driver? Lyft driver, a taxi driver, a bus driver, you need a driver's license. Are you hauling goods or services for interstate commerce? A truck driver, you need a driver's license. Are you a public servant in the performance of your public duties? A cop, a fireman, driving a fire truck, whatever. An ambulance driver, you need a driver's license. 
But if you're just getting up in the morning, leaving your house, going to the store, going to work, going to a movie, coming home, doing whatever it is you do, you're in your private business affairs. You don't need a driver's license. That's what. What about a title? You don't own your car. You don't own a car. No, you don't. You have a certificate of title. You don't own your car either. The state owns it. See, here's the thing. All right, let's tell you a little story. I happen to like Chevy, Crew Cab, Long Bed, Duramax, diesel trucks because I like farming and ranching. Okay? Yeah. If I walk into a Chevy dealership, it's called an automobile dealership, right? It's not called a motor vehicle dealership because it's not a motor vehicle when they sell it to you. It only becomes a motor vehicle when you title license and register it. Before that, it's an automobile. It's private. Who was our first car insurance company in the United States? It was called Traveler's Insurance. It was designed for travelers. That's what we are, we're travelers. We travel from point A to point B in our private business affairs 99% of the time, okay? You walk into an automobile dealership, if I laid out $75,000 cash for a brand new crew cab Duramax diesel pickup, and it might be 80 by now, at that moment in time, I own that truck. But the minute the salesman looks at me and says, I need another $250 for title license and registration, please, and I give them another $250 instead of that stack of 75,000, that's the moment I gifted that pickup to the state. So what I do is I look at them and I say, no, that's not necessary. I'm going to export it to a foreign country. And then when I get in and I turn the key and I drive it off of their lot, I'm driving it out of the state of Oregon into Oregon. I just exported it into a foreign nation. Yeah, manufacturer's statement of origin is in that little envelope that comes with your truck. When you pay the $250, he removes that. He right. fills it out. He sends it to the state. He sent the state the title, and you get a certificate. A certificate means there's a title out there somewhere, but you don't have it. <laughs> you don't have it. You don't own these cars. How does that work if you get pulled over? If you own your car, they can't do anything to you. Yeah, but you don't have a license plate. Wait, by the time we're into this three-day thing, you're going to be blown away. I'm telling you. Okay? See, the reason I talk so much about driving and, and uh, automobiles is because that's usually the first place any one of us gets into trouble in our life. We get a ticket or something else. But it's usually associated with driving or operating a motor vehicle by a person, a citizen, or a resident. So what is the legal definition of the word citizen? City is municipal. Zen is servant. A municipal servant. Isn't that what our public servants are? We're calling ourselves the same thing we're calling our public servants? We're, we just became, we registered with the Department of Human Resources, with the HR department of the state of, by the way, where's the state of Utah located? Uh, Washington, D.C. 44 Northwest Congress Avenue, Washington, D.C. Okay. It's not even in Utah. Utah is a foreign nation to the state of Utah. What about the city of Riverton? That's a subsidiary of the county of Salt Lake County, which is a subsidiary to the state of Utah. They're all private for-profit entities. Bill Clinton revealed that to everybody. He sold off all of government. Everything is a private for-profit entity. Everything that wasn't already previously sold off, which was most of it to begin with, he sold off what was left a private for-profit entity. It has a Dun & Bradstreet number. 
You, anybody know what Dun & Bradstreet is? It's a credit reporting agency for corporations, right? So if they've got a Dun & Bradstreet number, that means they're a corporation, right? What does the Supreme Court say? It says, since governments have chosen to incorporate, they must follow the same rules as any other corporation. Well, wait a minute. Can a guy wearing a Walmart shirt, little blue shirt, come into your house, kick your door down, and steal your kids? What would you do? <laughs> well, wait a minute. City of Riverton Police is a private for-profit entity, a corporation with the Dun & Bradstreet number. They're no different than Walmart. They operate through the consent of the government. They have to get your tacit agreement that you're a citizen or person or resident. What is the legal definition of the word person? An entity or a vessel? An entity or a vessel? What is the legal definition of the word resident? Someone there temporarily to do business. What's your zip code, Jody? By writing that on the letter to your grandmother, by writing your zip code on the letter to your grandmother, you just told the United States Postal Service, and what are our courts? Post offices. See, I already teased you with that, right? They're banks and post offices. So by writing this on the letter to your grandmother, you just told the Postal Service, our court system, that you'll inhabit that you live in Washington DC and that you just reside in Riverton temporarily to do business. So there's 337 million people in the United States who live in Washington DC and about 40,000 state nationals who live in the rest of the states. But you guys just move in temporarily to do business all around us. How do you feel about that? Huh? Yeah, it's the truth. So you write a letter and so put brackets around the zip code. Ah, why, why do you put brackets around the zip code? Put it back where it belongs. No, to remove it from the contract. It's called the boxing rule. Oh. Brackets would be the equivalent of the it, Four corners. The four corners rule, the boxing rule. Brackets have four corners. Five years ago, I was made an ambassador for the Voice of Youth program. Uh, Voice of Youth was a part of the World Benefit Church. The World Benefit Church was put in to place for one reason and one reason only. Not to have a congregation and preach the gospel, but to educate world leaders on God's laws on what's right and what's wrong. It's the only reason they, they were put into place. The Voice of Youth program was put into place to be the voice of people who couldn't speak for themselves, our minors. What is the legal definition of the word minor? It's someone under the age of 18, right? We all know that part of it. Or, this part we don't know, someone of any age who hasn't claimed their minor estate. Have you claimed your minor estate? You're a minor. Have you? Have you? Did you even know you had a minor estate? What if I told you you were worth millions of dollars and you didn't even know it? <laughs> and what if I could prove it to you? And that you have a trust fund and you're all trust fund babies. And that trust fund is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And so when you signed that mortgage, they borrowed out of your trust fund and paid it off. And then you just keep paying it back and paying it back and paying it back. Why is that? Five years ago, as ambassador of Voice of Youth, I gave a speech at The Hague. And I told our world leaders the story of a mother. And the story of a mother, I was told afterwards 
from just about everybody that this is the more, most important story that should be told every man, woman, and child on earth, but that they don't want me to tell it. You never tell me not to do something that's right because then I'm going to tell it over and over and over again. Okay? A mother, nine months pregnant, pay close attention to this, guys. I'm telling you. It's important for your life, your children's lives, your grandchildren's lives for generations to come. But a mother, nine months pregnant, walks into a foundling hospital. What is the legal definition of the word foundling? It's a safe place to abandon a child. Did you know all churches, all hospitals, all police stations, and all fire stations in the United States are designated as foundling by Congress? You can take a baby and put it in a basket and walk into any of those four locations <clears throat> and set that basket down on the floor and smile and wave and walk out without any consequences to yourself whatsoever. Can you even imagine that? That you can abandon a child? But they designated those places as foundling hospitals. Did they tell you? On a brass plaque somewhere in an obscure location inside the hospital, probably under a stairwell, it says this hospital is a foundling hospital. Found lean hospital. So a mother, nine months pregnant, walks into a foundling hospital. She goes through a major medical procedure called childbirth where she's in pain and under duress. She's probably under the influence of painkillers of some type. You gotta be pretty tough to give birth. <laughs> I wouldn't wanna do it. <laughs> anyway, She has that beautiful baby and all she's thinking about is getting home with it and leaving. But see, the baby in history, throughout history, came out of the water, was tugged through the birth canal, was docked at the dock by the dock tender where a bill of lading was filled out and received on the cargo, where its soul was taken, its soul plates, the footprints of the baby. The placenta was taken. Okay. They took the baby's soul and they sent it out with a tug and it's presumed dead and lost at sea until it should return and claim its minor estate. No physician delivers a baby. Only a doctor does. Doctor is doc tender. The baby is a vessel, a ship. That's where the all caps name comes in. If you look at the names of ships, they're in all capital letters, okay? No one disclosed the terms and conditions of the contract, yet you were handed a stack of papers to fill out, and you were only told, and this was right out of the nurse's manual, this is just to register your baby with the state and to give it a name. And you fill out the paperwork, and you name your baby, and you sign as an informant. What is the legal definition of the word informant? Someone who gives someone else up to another, thereby giving the title and equity of your child to the state. This creates a doctrine called parents patre. I guess I should write that. It's Latin for state is your parent. State is the parent. Creates a doctrine of parents patre. Through this doctrine, that's how they have control over you. And through your consent of being a citizen, a person, a resident. Three things you never want to be. I hope the chair's not too comfortable. I don't want, I don't want to see you doing that now. All right, I'll throw something at you. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> the doctrine of parents patre. 
So no terms and conditions of the sales contract were given. No full and honest disclosure of the contract. No two wedding signatures. No one there was securities licensed, insurance licensed. No prospectus was given. If you go to your stockbroker and you want to invest in a corporation, you, he is required by law to give you a prospectus, right? And you weren't given one. What I'm trying to teach you here is it was all done through fraud without any full and honest disclosure of the contract. You were licensed, bonded, insured, your vessel was created, a SUSTA QV trust was created. A SUSTA QV trust is an individual trust underneath the umbrella of the public charitable trust. So the Public Charitable Trust Act of 1882 created the Public Charitable Trust. The SESTA QV Trust Act created the SESTA QV Trust, each individual trust that you all have through your birth certificate and registration. On your birth certificate, there's a bank name. It's on bond paper. There's a CUSIP number, C-U-S-I-P number. What is a CUSIP number? It's an investment control number that's regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. If you were born between 1933 and 1975, you were bonded for $630,000 and insured for $1,000,000. If you were born after 1975, you were bonded for $1,000,000 and insured for two. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's just the initial investment. It's an initial upfront investment. You were a few days old, right? So like me, I was born on April 20th on 420. Nice. <laughs> I knew there would be one in the crowd. <laughs> and my vessel was created on 5-3. Two different dates, two different events. My vessel was born on May the 3rd. I was born on April 20th. For that period of time, I was a state national. In fact, I was a Californian. I was born in California, and I was a state national. I was a free, independent, one of we the people for that long. And then I got registered, and I became a citizen, a person, and a resident. And I lost all my diplomatic immunity. I lost it all. I became a servant, a slave. See, the 13th Amendment, the Constitution freed the black slaves, and the 14th Amendment, the Constitution made all of us slaves. See, there's a maximum law that says that in which one creates, one controls. God created me and he controlled me. And then unknowingly, while under duress, without any full and honest disclosure of the terms and conditions of the contract, with no one even licensed to explain it available, my mother warded me to the state in a birth ward. I became a ward of the state. Why do you think a birthing ward is called a ward? I became a ward of the state, a ward of the court, under the doctrine of parents patre. I became a slave, and I didn't even know it. I grew up thinking I was free. I fought for this country, I thought I was free. I got shot, I thought I was doing it for the right reasons, so I was free. Now I teach veterans how to get rid of PTSD. And I can do it in 20 minutes. I know guys that have been going to psychologists for years and taking drugs for years trying to get rid of their PTSD and it destroys their wives and their families and themselves. And I can solve it in 20 minutes. How? 
I explain a little, a little something that's off track. So would you do me a favor? Get, tell, remind me to tell you, okay? It's very important. All right. What happens? What happens at our birth with the SESTA QVM? First of all, we have a PCT, Public Charitable Trust, an umbrella. There's 337 million little CQVs. SESTA QV trusts, one for each of us, right? In this country. Say that one more time. CQV. Yeah, every individual in the United States and in most countries of the world have a SESTA QV trust. And we have this CQV. And here's what happens, and this is incredibly important. You all know basic accounting? What is that? It's a balance sheet, right? A balance sheet. It's got debits and credits. You guys have been thinking you're the debtor. They keep telling us that, right? We're in debt, we're a debtor. We owe money on credit cards, we owe money on our houses, we owe money on everything. What happens at birth though, and what, I'm just gonna use the figures from 75 to now because it's round numbers. We were bonded for $1 million. What does that mean? That means the bank went to the International Monetary Fund and the bank on behalf of the public under your CUSIM number borrowed from the International Monetary Fund $1 million in ones, fives, tens, twenties, fifties, hundreds, and they threw it out there into the general public. They distributed that $1 million to the bank for every person who's born. That's what they do. On the credit side, $1 million worth of United States Treasury bonds are issued and they're sold. They're hypothecated. They are bundled and they are sold on the stock exchange. And if we wanted to, I could pull up a website if we had internet access, and I could put in one of your CUSUP numbers, and I could show you the companies that are buying and selling you today. You have more than one CUSUP number, by the way. As we increase in value, I'll just put it that way, as we get better in our life, the more we join the military or get more college degrees, we get more and more CUSIP numbers. You are the credit. You are the creditor. They're making you believe you're also the debtor. And you are. You're both. This is your vessel. This is you. Okay? This is your labor. This is your worth. <clears throat> I got five college degrees. Every time I got an advanced degree in college, I got a new CUSIP number. It's in the military, I got a new CUSIP number. All these CUSIP numbers are attached to my main birth number. Okay. Is this in a bad spot? Anyway, let's stop here. It's a balance sheet, right? It's balanced. It's got a million on one side, a million on the other. This gets invested. It keeps growing and growing and growing. And let's just say it grows to $100 million. And by the way, that figure's low. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. I've seen individuals worth $35 billion or more that didn't know they had a dime. Okay, it keeps growing and growing and growing. Our first 18 years of life, we're not spending anything. So nothing is going over here, our first 18 years. That's growing and growing and growing for 18 years and it's being hypothecated and traded. And they've done a good job of managing it. They really have. First 18 years, it's growing and growing and growing. You're not spending anything. You're not adding anything to the debit side. Then you go get a job and you get married and you go out and you buy a house. I'm just gonna use numbers. The numbers themselves don't matter. It's the concept, okay? You buy a car or two, you buy some utilities or two over your lifetime, some medical bills, some food, whatever. They keep track of it all through your tax returns, your credit card, your bank statements, 
banking is all tied into the IMF, the Federal Reserve. We've got a big buildings of bean counters called the Department of Fiscal Services, and they, those accountants just keep track of everything. Everybody's life. And this all starts to add up on the debit side. And this just keeps growing and growing and growing on the investment side. At some point in time, you die, and it goes through probate. They take some of this, and let's just say over your lifetime you've spent, I'm going to round it off to $10 million. So they subtract $10 million out of your investment, and they pay off all this and it becomes a zero balance. They even pay back the initial loan to the International Monetary Fund, plus interest. That was a loan from a foreign entity, by the way, <laughs> to the Public Charitable Trust. And they pay it back. The balance is zero. Now this has, let's just say for this discussion, has $90 million left in it. What happens to it? The Sesta QV Trust lives on in perpetuity forever. So it keeps going. Everyone who has ever died since 1933 is currently funding government. This money gets reinvested. They can't take this, but the balance must stay the same forever. But if it keeps earning, they just sweep it off the top and it funds government. It's called off-book funds. In the states, it's GSA, and in the federal government, it's CQV. And it continues to fund government. Why do you think they don't care if they spend $3 trillion on foreign entities? Because it's not their money. It came out of your trust. It's not part of taxes. In fact, if you took the entire federal budget, how much is derived from taxes and tariffs? If you call up the Department of Fiscal Services and you send a FOIA request, and you ask them, who is the largest contributor to the federal budget? The Department of Justice to the tune of $1 trillion a day is taken out of our SESTA QV trusts or our court systems every day, a $1 trillion. That's more in 25 days than our entire gross domestic product in a year. In 25 days. They don't have to disclose the CQV. See, I had to prove this in federal court to get to talk about it. So, a big portion of this comes out of this before we die. Every time you have a court case, they get it. the case is a CUSIP number, the case number. The court clerk is the banker. Mary at the Ninth District of Federal Court, I showed how upon indictment, now when someone gets indicted, are they found guilty? No, no, they're not found guilty. They haven't even been tried. But upon indictment, upon indictment, Mary filled out the SF-273 form with the Department of Fiscal Services, which is called a bid bond form. She told the Department of Fiscal Services with this form to begin liquidation of this person's account because we're going to need some of it. You got to remember, they're in U.S. Treasury bonds. They're not liquid capital. They have to be sold off. That takes a little bit of time, right? So she filled out that form in this particular case in October. The trial 
was set for January didn't happen until April. Upon the day of the trial, the exact day of the trial, Mary filled out the SF-274 form with the Department of Fiscal Services, which is called a performance bond, telling the Department of Fiscal Services that this person has been found guilty and they will have to perform. what a performance bond is. It's, it's notifying someone that, the, that you're going to have to perform. Okay? This was supposed to take place July 13th. I pushed it to August 30th. Mary filled out the SF-275 form, which is the payment form. It's no different than a wire transfer order. It would have told the Department of Fiscal Services to wire transfer that money to the court. Now what money am I talking about? The, amount the penal sum. So an indictment, an indictment is a bill, true bill. If you don't pay the bill, you're brought up on charges. You're tried for those charges. This particular case, the woman, the grandmother, had four felony counts of fraud. Each had a penal sum, each count had a penal sum of $2 million. That's eight million total. In addition to that eight million, The judge was going to receive 95,000 in what they call net retention. And the prosecutor, 50,000 per count, four counts. Oh no, because they share that with the defense attorney that she had that she paid 27,000 out of her pocket to represent her. So what is the legal definition of the word attorney? Anybody know? Not the ones that watched my class. <laughs> Gotta watch him. <laughs> An actor to a turn. The legal definition of the word actor is someone who gets up on stage and lies convincingly enough to make you believe in the character and the plot. Therefore, a liar. What is to a turn? To steal from one and turn over to another. So by the very definition of their profession, they're liars and thieves. See, God only warned us about four professions in the Bible. Do you know what they were? Attorneys. Bankers, attorneys, doctors, an organized religion. Why did he warn us about organized religion? Joseph Smith warned the Mormon church about organized religion. He said that someday in the future it would be corrupted by men. He said that. In fact, he says, I doubt it will last 75 to 100 years. And he was right. How many people are not brought up LDS in this room? Just a couple, okay? It's all right, I'm gonna talk, talk to you about the church. I grew up LDS. In fact, my mother was born in Lehigh in a one room log cabin with a dirt floor on the Indian reservation while her dad taught English to the Indians here in 1917. My dad, in the 50s, right after he got out of the war, World War II, he was on a Navy in the USS Texas, he ran the church welfare ranches. He was head of the, all the church welfare ranches. My family has a long history here. Um, the Bennetts were the contractors for Brigham Young. 
they built Brigham Young's house. David Bennett's name is on the church of Bear Lake. That's my grandfather on my mom's side. My grandmother was born somewhere in Nebraska along the Platte River in the back of a wagon on their way here. Okay. So I printed off DNC 98. What is the Doctrine and Covenants? Doctrine is the laws the churches to live by. Covenant is a promise to live by those laws. That's why it's called a doctrine and a covenant. They promise to live by these laws. What was that again? 98. I'm just going to read a little bit, and my eyes are bad, so. And the writing is small. <clears throat> I'm going to start with. Uh, Verse 3, therefore he giveth this promise unto you with an immutable covenant, that it shall be fulfilled, and all things wherewith you have been afflicted shall work together for your good, and to my name's glory, saith the Lord. And now verily I say unto you concerning the laws of the land, it is my will that my people should observe to do all things whatsoever I command them that the law of the land, which is constitutional, supporting the principles of freedom in maintaining rights and privileges, belongs to all mankind and is justifiable before me. And then it moves on. Therefore, I, the Lord, justify you and your brethren of my church in befriending that law, which is the constitutional law of the land. He says, make it your friend. The constitutions. That's our supreme law. And as pertaining to the law of man, whatsoever is more or less than this cometh of evil. I, the Lord God, made you free, therefore ye are free indeed, and the law also maketh you free. Nevertheless, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Wherefore, Honest men and wise men should be sought for diligently, and good men and wise men ye should observe to uphold. Otherwise, whatsoever is less than this cometh of evil. Rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. What is the legal definition of the word legal? This is going to just kick your butts when I tell you what the definition of the word legal is. It is the undoing of God's law. What is legal is not lawful. And what is lawful is not legal. Let that sink in for just a second. What is legal is the undoing of God's laws. All throughout the Bible, God taught us a lot of things, and I studied the Bible very, very well for a lot of years. And I went to every religion on earth that I could go to. I've been to China. I've sat with the Buddhists. I've been all over this world. When I was in intelligence with the government, when they had something that dealt with religion, they sent me. They sent me into the basement of the Vatican with a group of people to look at the lost scrolls. And we brought out the United States government, brought out of the basement, the Maccabees, Esther, the wisdom of Solomon, many books of the Bible that weren't in the Bible. Okay? And there's many more down there. Many more. The, the Catholic Church suppressed us like you wouldn't believe. They kept so many things hidden from us. There are books of the Bible that reveal exactly what is happening in this world today. And we recorded it. And we know what it is. And uh, anyway, I'll go into some more off camera. <laughs> but what I'm trying to tell you, I quit going to church 20 years ago. Doesn't mean I don't believe in the basic core teachings of this church. I do. I think they're the best family-oriented, 
most common sense church on the face of the planet. But I also know, just like Joseph Smith knew, that men would corrupt it at the highest levels. And all you have to do is ask yourself, who of the prophet and the 12 apostles are lawyers? That's all you have to ask. Okay. When I gave that talk in church, I was removed from the stand, hauled to the bishop's office, talked to, and I never went back. Okay. That's right. That's right. Tell an attorney that statutes aren't law, that what's legal is the undoing of God's laws. He, didn't, he never learned that in law school. So they base everything on a penal sum. No matter what crime it is you have, it's commercial. All crimes are commercial. So they get paid a net retention. Our Department of Justice collects the majority of our federal budget through our CUSIM numbers out of our SESTA QB trust. And they collect a great deal of that while we're still alive every time we go to court. In the state courts, it's called the GSA program. The federal court clerks, if you look at Portland, Oregon's building that pretty much Antifa destroyed, the federal courthouse in Portland, but it's a five-story building with two more stories below ground, okay? Judge Mosman, he, he's no longer there, but he had the top four, him and his aides. U.S. Marshal Service has the bottom four down in the basement. That's the marshals. Then there's two more floors of judges and courtrooms, two floors. All the rest of this building are court clerks. Court clerks. Why do they need hundreds? I mean, they're in cubicles. Why do they need, this building covers an entire city block. It's a big building. Why do they need so many court clerks? They're bank tellers. <laughs> Mary, the head court clerk, Mary, runs all the tellers. She's the bank president. She handles all the bonds. The federal courts buy all the state bonds. So everything that happens in the ninth district, which is California, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, anything that happens in any of those state courts under the GSAs, the federal government buys them. The federal court buys them from the states. That's what funds the states. And then they collect out of our trusts through the Department of Fiscal Services. So those people are sitting there in their cubicles, typing on the computer, and they're filling out the SF-273, 274, and 275 forms all day long. For, yeah, it's a bank. So when these uh, blue and white lights come on behind you and uh, you got that policy enforcement revenue collection agent behind you, who the Supreme Court has says has no obligation to protect you. No, it's not their duty. It is not the police officer's duty to protect you. Their job title is a policy revenue collection agent. They're, they're to help fund the counties and the cities and the state. They presume you're a citizen, a person, a resident. Your status. This is called status. Anybody know what status is? Did you know there was more than one? Jeez, they just didn't want you to know this crap, do they? See, in Title VIII, Section 1101 of the United States Code, it, it says definitions of statuses. These are the definitions of status that the United States government accepts, right? You can be a U.S. citizen or a U.S. national or a state citizen or a state national or a variety of other things that they accept. But what are you taught? 
just to be the one that they have control over. Isn't that crazy? It is status. They presume your status. This government works off of unrebutted presumption. Unrebutted presumption. They steal your house by making a lot of clerical errors and you don't correct them and you acquiesce. You just pay the bills and you don't correct those errors and they stole it from you on behalf of the state. They steal your car when you go to the dealership and buy one by making a statement with the clerical errors that you fill out, you sign, you consent to, and then they stole your car. And you didn't even know it. You come home, you tell your family, look at my new car! <laughs> smell good, smell, got that new car smell, so nice. It's the states. You don't have the MSO or the MCO. Now, they assume you did something wrong. You did 70 and a 55. <laughs> Doesn't matter what it is. They assume you did something wrong. They get your tacit agreement of you being a citizen, a person, a resident. And then they get up on stand and they lie. And your attorney sits there and says, shh, don't say anything. We'll get our chance later. And then the hammer gets dropped and every lie that they said became truth and fact upon the record. You acquiesce to it. And your attorney knew that. He knows he's supposed to object to everything they say. And he sat there and he was quiet. And he told you not to speak because you can't. They can't hear you anyway. You know a judge can't hear you in court? Yes, can. No, nah, they summons you into court. What is a summons? It's a seance. They're wearing black robes. This is a satanic ritual. They summon you into court, a seance, calling the dead into court. And there's two ways for you to appear in court. There's only two. It's in the law. There's general appearance. That's where you just show up generally and you, you accept jurisdiction by just showing up. I get your tacit agreement of you being a citizen, personal resident. You just show up. They call the dead into court and there you are. They call out your all caps name and you don't say, no, that's not me, your honor. That's my vessel. I take ownership of that vessel. I claim the minor estate. You don't say any of that. First words out of your mouth in a courtroom should be what? Okay, I'm sitting down in the back row. Judge walks in. Bailiff says, I'll rise. I lean back on my chair and I put my feet up. <laughs> I sure ain't going to stand when he walks in. That's giving him jurisdiction. When an employee walks into the room, does this boss stand? No. He's my public servant. I have to take control of the court immediately. He, he's, if you stand, you're the employee, he's the boss. He's getting your tacit agreement. You're turning over jurisdiction to him. Uh, were you in Logan at, the, at uh, Cody's deal where we had about 60 people there? Okay, we had about 60 people in Cody Smith's court case in Logan, Utah. And I met with everybody before we went. And I told them, not only do not stand when the judge walks in, but I want you to make a concerted effort to lean back and put your feet up. <laughs> and they did. There was only one reporter on the other side that stood up. Nobody else did. And then in one voice, when they started running over the top of Cody, we all said, let him speak in one voice. And Cody got to speak. The entire court changed. What I tell people is, rally the troops. Get them in there on your behalf. 
If you can get at least 25 people in the audience doing what I'm just telling you to do, when you stand up up there, say, I'm here by special divine appearance, Your Honor, to call for a constitutional court of record, and I brought a grand jury with me. What is the definition of peers? No, here's one that's really got screwed up by our Bar Association. When you call for a jury trial or a trial by jury, what's the difference? Do you guys know? Always call for a trial by jury. Why call for a trial by jury? The, yeah, but the trial by jury, the jury decides your fate. A jury trial, the judge can override the jury's decision and do whatever he wants. And they will try and force you into a jury trial. They will. Now, here's a definition twist on the word peers. The definition of the word peers is someone from your own neighborhood, who knows your character and your situation in life, for only then can you truly judge a man. What do they get? They question the jury because they don't want anybody that even knows you. They want people from other counties, other areas of the state. They want to rig the trial to railroad you. To railroad is to lead somebody down a narrow path or rail to a predetermined outlook or conclusion, and that's the path. Does that make any sense yet? Oh, the fraud in which we perceive, right? It's ridiculous. And when you stand up from that back row when they call your name and the very first words out of your mouth when you stand up and you take your first step is, I'm here by special divine appearance, Judge, to settle this matter, to call for a constitutional court of record, to ask for a summary judgment upon the truth and facts placed upon this record by my documents, and I stand firmly upon my rights. Can I get that summary judgment, Your Honor? This thing is over with. But they can't give you They have to, to do a summary judgment. The rule of three. Rule of three applies, applies in all things. Celestial, terrestrial, and telestial, right? The rule of three. You have to ask them three times. And if they have an important question, they're supposed to ask you three times. And if not, you can say, what did you say again? How does a judge derive their authority? Since you brought it up. Number one, from his oath, oath of office, can't write. And any other requirements by the state to hold office. His oath and any other requirements by the state to hold office. That's how he derives his authority. Second, he derives his authority by statute. What did I say a minute ago? It's the worst looking E I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> the rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. Third, he derives his authority through parents patre. See, my first three questions, the very first document I submit if we have to go to court, is a notice 
of appearance. A notice of appearance. I'm going to say, hey, I received this seance in the mail where you're calling the dead entity into court. And I'm willing to appear to settle this matter, but I'm going to do it by special divine appearance. As a living soul. See, what does Genesis 2, 7 say? Bible scholars in this room, I can see that. Genesis 2, 7 says, I'm not trying to give you a hard time, it's just kind of fun. But, uh, <laughs> and I, God, created man from the dust of the earth, and I breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So are we men or are we living souls? We're living souls. Our bodies are made up of what? Energy. The dust of the earth, and they're held together by energy. The energy of our soul. The celestial, telestial, and terrestrial souls. Which, by the way, they're here helping us right now in a big way. Any business they have of you is just a vessel, but when you're showing up by your divine... Exactly. I'm just here to sell this matter as the executor to the trust. So therefore it's not really you. It's here. Yeah. That vessel that they can arrest and do all of these things to, if it was there. Well, what I'm doing is breaking through their veil. They're not allowed to even talk to me yeah. as a man. They're not even allowed to talk to me. I'm going to break through their veil and Does educate that them. create that barrier? That it, because if, if you did something as the vessel, now you are that ward of the court. You now, if the sheriff takes you away, you're in that system. Ah, what did I say? Genesis 1, 26 through 28. God gave me man dominion over the land, the air, and the water, and this is law. I'm going to show you how to take dominion this weekend. And when you take dominion over all three jurisdictions, you are free. If you jump out of one into another with both feet, they'll destroy you in the other two. All these wonderful patriot groups out there, I love them. But they're trying to jump out of two jurisdictions into one. And they go to jail over and over and over again. I watched them do it for 35 years, and then I watched the people behind them not stand up for them when they get there. And I'll sh I can show you how to be free so you never, never get into that position. Okay? That's probably a good time. So I formed three questions out of this to the judge in my notice of a special appearance. I say, judge, or your honor, do you claim to derive your authority over me based upon your oath of office and any other requirement of the state? Yes or no? May I have a copy of those to make sure that they're up to date and current before I arrive into court? Because if he doesn't have his current oath on file the way he's supposed to, and they seldom do, case dismissed. Judge, do you claim to derive your authority over me based upon statute, yes or no? I'm setting him up. <laughs> I'm pinning him in a corner because he's going to answer yes. Of course I do. Great. Then where's my paycheck stubs? Where's my company car? Where's my 401k? You're claiming I'm, a, I'm an employee of the state, of the county, of the city? Where's my paycheck stubs? I think you owe me a bunch. How much do you make? How much do these state employees get paid for driving a car around? Paid for by the state. I'm not at war. See, that's another thing. What is a warrant? It's a, a warrant. What is a warrant? It's a warrant. It's a declaration of war. They're declaring war upon you. I'm at peace. I, I, on my house, I fly the civil flag of peace. I walk into the courtroom with the flag of peace on my document. They can't declare war on me when I'm at peace. They can't hold me for contempt when I'm at peace. This is just a discussion. 
And they can't out debate me. The physical flag that you have? Yeah. What, what does it look like? Yeah. Gosh, you all think we have one flag in this country? We have lots of flags. The red, white, and blue that you all see is our war flag. We have a peace flag too. And it's red and white vertical stripes with a white background with blue stars. Look at the, look at the United States Coast Guard's flag. It's the civil flag of peace because they were developed as a civil organization. And then they put their logo in the middle of it and they called it the Coast Guard flag. But it's on a civil flag of peace. For three years in this country, this country was at peace and we flew the civil flag over all of our commerce buildings in our capitals. Three years. A long time ago, brother. Ever since. Especially since Rotten Lincoln. Stinking Lincoln. Communist. Follower of Karl Marx. Failed five times to run for, for, as president because nobody wanted him. Wasn't until the big bankers of Boston, New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia got behind him and put seven million in his campaign that he finally won. And then he couldn't be president of the de jure United States of America, so he bankrupted and formed a Delaware Corporation. And he made him put the Grand Army of the Republic in charge of the United States. And then he made himself commander in chief. And that's why every president since has been sworn in as commander in chief as well as the president of the corporation. President Trump is the first man that restored the republic by executive order. In fact, June 22nd of 2019, in the Rose Garden, he gave me that hat. One more reason why they're against me. Explain that again. And he told me, I restored the republic and now it's up to you. And if you look at all his executive orders, I don't care whether you're a Trump fan or not, but if you're not, you will be by the end of this weekend. <laughs> because every executive order he has written goes something like this. I, Donald J. Trump, as president of the United States of America, that's our de jure government, take back our utilities from the United States. Which is a corporation. Do you know what he just did? And people read that and they don't even know jurisdiction. <laughs> See, they don't even know what he did. And he's done that over and over and over again on behalf of the people. He just keeps restoring the Republic over and over and over again. Right now, he's destroying the WHO and Fauci and the CDC and the, and the pharmaceutical companies. He's destroying Western medicine. He's destroying it all on behalf of you. He signed four executive orders, and then he had to hop on an airplane for fear he'd be shot. Five times in the last week, five attempts. Five in the last week? Yep, wow. just in the last week. They're grasping for straws. Grasping. Yeah, no, it's all right. They're not grasping for straws. they got to shut him down. Yeah. That's right, he knows it. And he's got the best Secret Service agents this history has ever seen. Those boys are tough. So is he, uh, if not, he'd be dead. I've heard rumors of him taking over the Fed or you know, abolishing the Fed. Yeah. Go to your bank and see how much coins they have. Yeah. See, our coinage, he took back for the United States of America. The Fed doesn't have access to it. There's a ton going on. I know IRS agents that have already received their pink slip and been told to look for uh, another job, okay? The, the wage and income tax has never been legal. It's always been a gift. Uh, Abe Lincoln did the 1040 bonds. The 1040 is still here. You consent to it by filling it out and signing it and sending it in. By your own consent and admission, you pay taxes. Nobody at the IRS can figure out why you keep sending them in. They just can't figure that out. But you just keep doing it, and they keep getting that gift, and they love every minute of it. Okay. Judge, do you claim to derive your authority over me based upon the doctrine of parents' patriae? Yes or no? They don't want to answer that question. So I say, Judge, yes or no?
Judge, I need an answer to that question. Yes or no? You don't want them to get away with shit. Okay? They're your public servants. Take control of the courtroom. Because he's going to assert that he doesn't have to answer to you. Yeah, he absolutely does. He absolutely does. He, he lost take, all immunity. He tries to take back command of that court. But, you know, I'm, the only state in the United States I've never been in is West Virginia. Do you know I helped remove the entire Supreme Court of West Virginia off the bench a couple of years ago? It was in all the papers. I've never even been in that state. But they were doing a lot of people harm. So we got them off the bench. They lose their immunity when they step outside of the scope and authority of the law in which we, the people, lay down. The minute they step outside of that scope and authority, they lost their immunity. As long as they're operating inside that, they're immune. We can't touch them. We can't sue them. But if we can prove... Okay. This is the most important question. You've got to get them to answer. These three questions, you get them to answer. Judge, do you claim to derive your authority over me based upon your oath of office, statute, parents, patria? You've got to get them to answer it. Once you do, you can destroy the case with those three questions. Because if I'm not a citizen, person, or resident, they have no authority over me as statute. I have limited diplomatic immunity. Do you need to ask each of those hmm? Limited diplomatic immunity? That means if I don't kill someone, or rape someone, or injure another human being, I am immune from any statute. The only thing I can be held accountable of is harming someone else. Love thy neighbor, do no harm. That's, that's our motto, okay? We're at peace. We love thy neighbor and do no harm. Does being at peace mean we can't shoot them in the head when they try and steal our kids? No, no it does not. You are protecting their that's right. In fact, most states have the imminent domain, our <coughs> castle laws. Our home is our castle, okay? Now, should we give them fair warning? Yes, we should what no trespassing signs are for. That's why you don't open your door. You don't step out on the threshold to talk to them. You hand them a little warning notice through the door while it's still chained, and you close the door and you lock it behind you. And then they get to read. And if you wrote that notice properly, they'll get in their car and they'll drive off and they won't come see you again. Three very, very important questions, and sometimes you must ask it three times. So, it, so if they refuse, you say, all right, Your Honor, I've asked you three times. You've refused to answer. This case is now dismissed without prejudice, and you walk out the door. And don't look back. As you're walking up, if you're sitting in the back row and they call your name, the minute you take your first step, I'm here by special divine appearance, Your Honor, to call for a constitutional court of record before you even get through that bar. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, you got to pay. Well, you have to establish your status standing in jurisdiction. So let's talk about that, status. We already did a little bit. Standing. Jurisdiction. I'm going to write it way over here. Why do I do that? First of all, the Bar Association misuses the word ju jurisdiction on purpose to confuse the public. It's probably the most misused word in the legal arena, okay, the legal stage. Why do I say that? Because I've already told you what the three jurisdictions are, land, air, and water. It's trust law, equity law, contract law. That's our three jurisdictions. What does the word juris mean? It means right, law. What does the word diction mean? 
You look words up in a dictionary, don't you? The words you use determines the right law under which you stand. So if I say I'm a party, what law am I under? The jurisdiction of the water. I'm a party to a contract. If I say I'm a trustee, what jurisdiction am I under? The air. If I say I'm a owner who holds superior title, I'm in the jurisdiction of the land. April the 22nd, I put on a class at the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. in front of a whole group of young lawyers. Well, William Barr actually set that up for me. Okay. And I put on the class similar to what I'm putting on now, but I didn't have as much time. So I had to cram it in really fast and in a very specific order. But I taught them one plus one is two. They didn't know that. They didn't know the basics of law. They're out there trying to do algebra and they don't even know one plus one is two. So I asked him, where, what is the law? Where did it come from? Where's its origins? How did we arrive at this thing called law where a small group of men could put something down on paper and hold me a man accountable? And I stood there like this. You could have heard a pin drop. They couldn't come up with an answer. They said, oh, one, one kid piped up and says, oh, it's Bill on Capitol Hill. And you know that little cartoon thing? He was repeating that. I just went. <laughs> and then I told them about Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And I told them the basics of law, and I taught them about jurisdiction. See, they thought it was in the city's jurisdiction, or the county's jurisdiction, or the state's jurisdiction, or the federal government's, or this agency, or that agency. They thought that was what jurisdiction means. No, that's venue. Who has the authority over it in that location is venue. Jurisdiction is, do they have authority? In, and in which law do, do they have authority? So after I got done, this young attorney came up, 29 years old, he looked like he was 12. He was a grandson of a judge and the son of a judge. Long line of judges, very smart man. He could rattle things off like you wouldn't believe. But he thanked me for what I had taught. And he said, can I tell you a story? And I said, sure. He says, when he was 16 years old and his dad was teaching at Georgetown Law, he got to go and sit in one of his dad's classes. And his dad taught law just like I did. Land, air, and water. And he says, but it, he said it a little bit differently than you did. And I said, well, how did he say it? Because I took several hours to talk about it. He says, he, he, he said it in a few minutes. And I said, well, then I want to know because I've been doing this like 35 years, right? And the first 20 years, I made it really complicated and I could talk really fast and I would just blow people's minds and none of them would listen and I'd have a group of 20 people. And then a year later, I'd go back and I'd still have the same group of 20 people. I go, this isn't working. <laughs> About the noisiest little go-kart I've ever heard. <laughs> anyway, I said, this isn't working. If I'm going to get the same people year after year, the same 20, this isn't going to work. How can I wake up America? Right? And he said this. He says, when a man walks into a courtroom, the very first thing he sees when he walks in is a little sign up on the judge's desk that says, Your Honorable Bob Smith, or whatever the judge's name happens to be. The reason it says honor is because you can't have honor without trust. You can't have trust without honor. Which form of law is trust law? The jurisdiction of the air, the highest form of law. It is superior law. There is nothing more important in the law than having a fiduciary responsibility for the benefit of another. Okay, so he said this, the very first job title hat the judge puts on when he walks in the room is your honor hat. 
the very first thing he's going to administer, the first juris he's going to administer is the jurisdiction of the heir. He wants to see if the man walked in with his express trust in hand. There's two types of trusts. Express and implied. This is written and this is unwritten. And if the man doesn't walk in with his express trust in hand, then the judge is going to imply a trust where he's the executor and you're the trustee who has somehow mismanaged the trust on behalf of the beneficiary who's the prosecution or whoever's bringing the case. And therefore you owe the prosecution something for your mismanagement. What is a misdemeanor, by the way? What is demeanor? It's your attitude. Mm -hmm. It's a miss. You got a bad attitude, go sit in the corner. You got a misdemeanor. You got the wrong attitude. That's what a contempt charge is. It's a misdemeanor. Right? All right. Words are important. And we just don't understand them. Never taught English in school. That's why, that's why attorneys have a whole separate word for it. They call it legalese. Legalese is a separation of words in the English language into one of three jurises. So... If I'm a driver or an operator of a motor vehicle upon the highways, I have to have a driver's license. But if I'm a traveling in private upon the high, on the roadways in my private automobile, all I need is my passport. <laughs> See the difference in the words? They both mean going down the street in a car. Both those sentences. See? But the word you use determines the jurist you're under. And it's up to you to determine your own words. That's right. They open their mouth. Yeah, you have the right to remain silent. Everything you say can and absolutely will be used against you. Okay? And they'll bait you. Those cops will go, now, are you driving that automobile? No, they won't say that. They'll ask you if you're operating that motor vehicle, right? So, if the man walks in with his express trust in hand that clearly states who the executor is, who the trustee is, has an acceptance of the trustee to be the trustee, that's so they can't break the trust bail. It's important. Tells who the beneficiary is, what property the trust is managing and how it's supposed to be managed for who the heirs, then there's nothing for him to adjudicate. He can't imply a trust if there's an express trust in hand. He has to go by the express trust. And you know what? Trusts are private. You don't have to show the judge a trust. He, he does not need to read it. All you have to do is walk in and you say, Judge, you can't imply a trust when I have an express trust that clearly states who the executor is, who the trustee is, has an acceptance of the trustee to be the trustee. It tells who the heirs are and the beneficiaries, what property is supposed to be managed by the trust, and how the trust is supposed to be managed. And then you just set it back down on your table. <laughs> he can't adjudicate it. So he has to take that hat off. And he puts on his judge hat. Now he's looking to see if there's a victim. If there's a victim, there's a crime that's going to trial. Physical injury to another. If there's not, it's civil. He turns his hat around. And he's looking to see if the man walked in with his superior titles in hand. Wait a minute, if it's an automobile case, do you have your MSO or MCO? You walk in with it? If you don't, he's going to imply the state has a certificate of title, the state owns it, and he's going to regulate you, and you're guilty. Ah, you see? Now let's say it's a foreclosure. If you walk in like Ken Cromer did with his 
land patent after I taught him how to do it, and his grant deeds and his superior titles in hand, they can't imply an abstracted title. So Ken gets to move back in his house. Okay. What about your life? If you walk in having claimed your minor estate and taken ownership of your birth certificate in hand, and you now own the vessel, you're not just a signatory officer. See, what is a person? A person is an office of the vessel. That's your job title. You're an employee as a person. That's why every state statute starts off by saying, all persons must do this, and all persons must do that, and all persons must do this. They don't say all men and women must do this. They can't regulate a man or a woman. They can't regulate somebody alive. You can only regulate a dead entity, a vessel, a person, a signatory officer. If I'm a man and I write my autobiography, which is the story of my life, and I go to the bookstore and sell it, and people line up to buy my book, do I put my signature on it or I sign my autograph? A man signs his autograph, and he does it on this side of the paper. A signatory goes on this side of the paper. A trustee signs in the middle. A signatory signs in blue with black ink. A man signs in red. A trustee having fiduciary responsibility signs in purple. You guys don't know the law. There's three jurisdictions. There's three places for a signature. There should be three seals. Do you have your own seal for each of your jurisdictions? Oh, I guess you're not free. Okay. So, if you have all your superior titles in hand and you stand firmly upon your rights, there's nothing for him to adjudicate. So he takes his judge hat off and he puts on his Mr. Administrator hat. Okay. Now he wants to see if you have your business affairs in order. He's looking at the jurisdiction of the water. He wants to see contracts. He wants to see your business affairs. Think Michael Jordan and Nike for just a minute. Michael Jordan signed a five-year contract with Nike for a billion dollars, 200 million a year, just so they could use his name. It's a good gig if you can get it, right? <laughs> During that time, a police officer couldn't even write Michael Jordan's name on a ticket without the prior express written permission of Nike or Michael Jordan. <laughs> See, they can regulate commerce, but they can't interfere in it. Title 15 of the United States Code becomes your savior because it says any documents that they used your trademark name on must be destroyed. So that ticket goes through a paper shredder. Absolutely, you want to trademark your name. So how do you take dominion over your three jurises? Is first you do a trust. And, and now I'm going to back up. You have to take status first. You've got to claim who you are. Claim your status. Do we make enough copies uh, of those? Pass one of those out to everybody. You have to claim your status. Status, standing, and jurisdiction is everything in the law. Everything. You have to know who you are and what status. Maximal law, again, is that in which one creates, one controls. As a state national, I'm one of we the people who created government. Guess what I control? Government. Government created the U.S. citizen guess who they control? You, the U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Say, we're not free in this country. As long as you self-determine that you're a U.S. citizen, you are not free. Now, is there anything wrong with being a U.S. citizen? Yeah, <laughs> yeah there is. That was a trick question I was throwing out there. Yeah. 
So you need to do your trust to take dominion over the air. You need to have your superior titles. And know your rights to take dominion over the land. Now, Michael Jordan and Nike, that's what I was on, that story. Let me ask you a question. CPS comes in people's houses every day and they steal kids. They kidnap kids as a private for-profit entity, not government. Half the people I talk to are not bad parents. Now, every once in a while, there's a drug dealer or somebody like that that needs their kids taken from them. Who should take them? A church or a family member. It's not up to government. Government shouldn't even be involved in the family unit at all. Zero. None. They have no business being in your family. Okay? None. I get sometimes 70 to 100 phone calls a day from parents all over this country whose children have been taken every day, day in, day out. I was with her yesterday and I got a phone call to listen to their story. Brought me to tears, didn't it? Not many people can handle those kind of stories. What if I had a business, ABC Inc., licensed by the Secretary of State's office, bonded with the gold and silver, which I like to use, One of the number one ways the government gets you is by being a pauper. I don't care how big a stack of this crap you have in your pocket, that's legal tender. It does not discharge a debt. It tenders it to a later date. When the probate of the balance sheet of the SESTA QB trust gets probated, the debts get paid. This never pays off a debt. It tenders it to a later date. But that does. And if you've got a silver or a gold coin on you, they can never deem you a pauper. And if you look in the law what a pauper means, every U.S. citizen is deemed a pauper, therefore a debtor. And they can never deem you a pauper if you've got a little gold and a little silver on you. In my pickup truck, I carry a little jeweler's sack with 40 pieces of silver on the door. They can never deem me a pauper. But it doesn't... Good man. But, but it's, it gives them control. You're unable to handle your own affairs. See, who, if you look up in the law, who can an attorney represent? They can represent an entity, a corporation, or a vessel. They can represent a minor. They can represent someone incompetent or somebody infirmed. They, they can represent a ward of the court and a ward of the state or a pauper. Did I leave some words out? See, they can't represent a man or a woman. Yeah, they can't represent a man or a woman. It takes three signatures to put you in jail. Did you know that? And if they don't have those three, you can't go to jail. Anybody know Gina Nielsen over in uh, Cache County, Utah? I met Gina after her trial. She was found guilty by a jury 
and she was going to be sentenced to 15 years in the state prison. By the way, Gina got held in contempt and thrown in jail for a little bit, but that's not a prison sentence. That's a misdemeanor, and it's go sit in the corner. You've been naughty. But she never spent one day in jail, and she never will. Her case has been dismissed. Why? Because I told her they require three signatures to put you in jail, Gina. They require yours by taking a plea, the prosecutors and the judges, or your attorney who will sign as your power of attorney on your behalf and throw you in jail. So it takes one of three signatures, the judges, the prosecutors, and either yours or your attorney. That's why they try and force you to have an attorney, because you're incompetent, you're infirmed, you're unable to speak for yourself, you're a citizen, a person, a resident, you're not sui juris. What does sui juris mean? Of one's own right. I walk in the courtroom sui juris. And they can't even speak to me. I have to tell them what to do. See, they might argue with me a little bit, but they never win. They can't win. It's impossible for them to win when you're sui juris. When you've taken dominion over your three jurisdictions, they can't win. So let's get back to Michael Jordan and Nike. <laughs> what if you ha owned your children? You took ownership of their vessels as your minor children, and you held them in trust, and you trademarked or patented, or did both, your children. See, what is the jurisdiction of the water? It's commerce, right? It's contracts and commerce. It's corporate bylaws. It's banking. The most important is contract law. So, if I had a business, ABC Inc., licensed with the state, bonded with gold and silver, and I went to the United States Patent and Trademark Office website, and on their T's Plus form, I trademarked my vessels, mine, my kids, my families, doing under a bulk trademark under that business name, and I took ownership of that. Meaning their name, business name? All caps name, their vessel name, the one that's on their birth certificate. Okay, we're talking about taking control of their vessel because that's what the courts care about. That's what they have parents patria over, right? You have parental rights over your living children. The problem is you don't have any living children. They're all dead entities to the state, see? So they take control over the vessel through parents patre. But if I take control over the vessel and I own my property, which is my children, they're a gift from God to me, okay? And I patent them and I, on the land, I put them in trust as a fiduciary and I trademark them in with my business and my business has a EIN number and a bank account and a product offered for sale in international commerce and my business has the intent to make a profit. And I go out and I put my children's names on t-shirts, my name on a t-shirt and their names on a t-shirt, just like Michael Jordan's name on a Nike t-shirt. And I offer them for sale on a website for $19.95. I'd make it $21.95. There's a little key about getting over 20 bucks, okay? So I offer it for sale for over 20 bucks on the internet. And I walk into a court wearing one of those t-shirts. And this is a child protection services case. And I say, I don't talk about the facts of the case because in reality, in their courts, no truth or fact shall be tried in court. It's all based upon presumption, assumption, tacit agreement, and hearsay. That's their motto. No truth or fact shall be tried in court. Okay? 
And I walk in there and I say, uh, you can't interfere in commerce. Your Honor, you can only regulate it. You're interfering in a trademark. I demand the return of my property, my trademarked property, and any document that idiot prosecutor put that name on without my express written prior permission, mm -hmm. I demand for it to be destroyed under USC Title 15. Case dismissed. So you walk in with your superior titles, you walk in with your express trust, you walk in with your business affairs in order, and there's nothing left for them to adjudicate. Case dismissed. I just told you how to win every lawsuit every time they come against you. But you have to get your affairs in order. You have to claim your status. You have to set up your trust. You have to record your superior titles and get hold of them and record them. Anyway. You're offered a contract is not accepted. You have a 72 hour right of rescission. You ignore anything, you're in trouble. Never ignore anything. Everything is banking laws. If your credit card company sends you out a bill, an invoice, you take it and you say, all right, I'll get to that and I'll pin it up on my fridge and I forget about it, right? Then what do they do? They send you a past due notice because you had 30 days to pay that bill. You had 72 hours first to rescind the contract once you filled out the credit card application. You had 72 hours to stop it. You didn't, you got the card in the mail, you went out and spent some money, then they sent you a bill. You got 30 days to pay it. If you don't pay it, they give you a 15 day past due notice. You got 15 days to pay it. At the 16th day, they cancel your credit card and they send you to collections. If you know anything about contracts, there's no privity of contract with a collection agent, okay? So let's say you owe a medical bill at the hospital and you can't pay it, so they send it for collections. They do this every day of the week, right? To just about everybody. And you can't pay it. And a collection agency goes to the hospital and buys that debt for 50 cents on the dollar and then they try and collect from you. Man, they call you up on the phone. You know what I say? I have a totally different conversation with them than you do. You, they run over the top of. Me, I say, oh my gosh, did you purchase that debt from the hospital? And they say, well, yes, we did. I say, thank you very much. I really needed that help in my life at this time. Thank you for doing that. But you and I, there's no privity of contract. But I appreciate it. And I'm done. Does that, okay. So does it work different if it's like, I have student loans? Oh, those are government backed. Pay for them with your Sustic QE trust. And I, I've got a question for you. Something just he, he just shakes his head and puts his head down. Did you see that? <laughs> no, wait a minute. Don't, don't go any farther yet. Wait a minute. I said, pay for them with your Sesta QV trust. And what was your thought when, you, when I said that? And you just kind of closed up and put your head down. See? We the people need to make friends with the United States Code. The United States Code was put into place for one reason, one reason only, and that's for us to hold our public servants accountable. In USC 50, there, Title 50, there is a way to pay your debts with your SESTA QV trust. You're the creditor. But you can't do it if you're a citizen. <laughs> Caveat, you have to become a state national. You have to become one of we the people. There's not many of us left. I think we've created about 40,000 We the Peoples in this country, maybe a little more than that. That was probably a year ago's figure. And that's it out of 337 million. Because every contract written is written by an attorney. 
And do you ever look at a document that's written by an attorney, it's got lines on it, and it's got little boxes on it, and things are boxed out? See, they know English language. They know legalese, they know styles. And they write contracts to eliminate the liability from the person paying them to write the contract and place that liability upon you. So they wrote you an unfair contract. And what you didn't do is walk in, sit down with them, get an agreement on how much to pay and how much to pay you were gonna pay and how much your down was, and then go home and write the contract, bring it back and say, here, here's my contract. Sign this. <laughs> and you didn't do it. See, you could have wrote a fair and honest contract, but you didn't. And so they took advantage of you because you didn't know any better. How many law classes did you have kindergarten through 12th grade? See, I say that over and over again because nobody does. And that's why the, when I was telling you the story about Justin in the Space Needle in the saddle and his, his, his buddy that came over that hired him says, who do you think controls it all? We write all the contracts. We write all the sales literature. We write all the invoices. We, write, we do this, we do that, we do it all. The Bar Association runs the world. And who are they? Do you know who they are? The British Accreditation Registry. The United States of America has a treaty, 1947, with the bar to operate upon these shores. Wasn't the first one, that's the newest one. Okay, if you, if, you, if you go to the communist country of Illinois that Abraham Lincoln used to run, if you go to their website, you look under the office of the Attorney General of the state of Illinois, and you click on the history tab, it says the Attorney General's office of the state of Illinois was put into place to protect and uphold the interests of the crown. Isn't the Attorney General the highest lawyer in the land of Illinois? And it was put into place to protect and uphold the interests of the crown? The British Accreditation Registry under is under the Crown. Under the U.S. Constitution, though, wouldn't that be treason? Hold on a minute. It's treason. No. We adopted it. You acquiesced. You haven't fought to change it. No, I'm, I'm just saying, okay? When I say you, I don't, I'm not pointing directly at you. Okay? No, here, here's the issue. The issue is... They're supposed to register under the Foreign Agents Registration Act under FARA. They don't. The British Accreditation Registry. You walk into a courtroom right here in Utah, and if you're not a member of the bar, they're not going to let you talk for somebody else, right? I can't go in and represent her unless I'm a member of the bar in Utah. They'll say no. Great. Show me where a bar licensed attorney is licensed by the state of Utah. They aren't. They're licensed by the bar. It's a labor union. It's no different than IBEW Electrical Workers Credit Union. So they don't have any more jurisdiction than you? No. None whatsoever. Except that's what that satanic cult called a court ha operates. The bar is Satan, guys. And five or six of those members are the head of the church. Yeah. You wonder why Utah's all screwed up. Huh? Yeah, what I'm what I'm trying to trying to say here is we need to take our country back as we the people. And we're at war with the Bar Association. And people don't even realize that. And some of our friends and our family and our next door neighbors are attorneys. And you know what the sad thing is? They don't know. Everybody is a compartmentalized legal idiot. Everybody, I don't care what job you have. 
you go to work every day and you just do your job and you have no idea what's going on over here or what's going on over here. See, if I laid the map of Utah out here, and this is Utah, the land, the geographical area map, and I drew a land patent on that map, and I put your home in that land patent, where you got it through a grant deed, then you actually have a superior title and you own that land, that home. But if I come in and I put a clear piece of plastic over the top, and I do things like change your name to all caps, and I change your address, and instead of land patent number 4361, I put lot three of block 27 of Spring Hill subdivision, and I redescribe your property, and I take it out of meets and bounds, and I make all kinds of clerical errors, and you come in and I send you those clerical errors on your tax invoice and you just write a check and send it back, guess what? I just stole your property on behalf of the state and you accept it. And until you come back and call fraud and correct the errors and educate me so I never do it again, because see, it took a lot of people. It took a cartographer, it took a appraiser, it took a tax assessor, it took a county recorder, it took a real estate agent, a title company, an attorney, blah, 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 blah. It took all these compartmentalized legal idiots to create a conspiracy to deprive me of my land. And every one of them was just doing their job. But when you add them all up and put the results together, that's exactly what they did, is they stole my home on behalf of the state, and they didn't even know it. So I'm not saying rush in and declare war on them and start yelling at them and tell them everything they did wrong. You gotta correct all the errors, and then educate them. We're seeing that now on our right? Mean, yeah, the same that's exactly what they're doing. These damn sheep around here that are wearing masks are killing this country. The recovery rate for COVID? That's right. Less than the common cold, less than the flu, less than H1N1, less than all the things we've had over the years. Why, we weren't in fear of it then. Why are we in fear of it now? How many people know somebody that died from it? I'm doing nine lawsuits right now. Nine lawsuits of family members that have died of COVID. One of them died in a motorcycle accident. One of them had stage four breast cancer, was with hospice for longer than she was supposed to live. But because they list COVID on her death certificate, she gets cremated. She had a plot already paid for next to her husband and her family is pissed. Yeah. And they want to sue. Yeah. All nine of them, their deaths were listed as COVID, and none of them died from COVID. What is COVID-19? Okay. That's one term for it. It's C, the sheep... Surrender. 19 is the code word for surrender in the, in the military. If I yell out an order, code 19, code 19, that means my guys on the front line are supposed to wave a white flag. So what's O-C-I-D? This is the ancient Greek word for sheep. This is a military code. The disease was called... SARS Corona 2. Why did they change the name? In the 2019 prospectus of the WHO, which was written in 2018, it described everything that's going on right now to a T. And this disease wasn't even here, supposedly. Going clear back to 2003. <laughs> what did you say? The old this has been planned. Old, old Greek or what? 
sheep. Okay. It's all a farce. Is the, is the disease real? Yes, it is. Okay. What does corona mean? Corona is a crown. It's an energy crown. Okay. It is a bacteria. This whole germ theory thing uh, has been debunked, guys. You cannot pass COVID or corona, whatever you want to name it. You can't pass it this way. You, the mask does nothing but harm you for wearing it. More people are now going to the hospital from the mask than were, would have went for COVID, okay? A lot of staph infections, a lot of things. The N95 mask, OSHA will tell you that it, it's only good in a sterile environment. That means an operating room. Once out of the operating room, the doctors remove it, throw it in the trash. It's only good in a sterile environment. This ain't a sterile environment, okay? It's not meant to be. We have immune systems. The best way for us to be immune from disease is to touch things <laughs> and get it on us. And then our body fights it off and it builds up an immunity. I haven't got sick in 40 years. I'm immune to everything. I live in horse shit, okay? People are dying right now from hand sanitizer. They're getting a hand sanitizer that has methyl in it, which almost all of them do, and they're getting them on their hands. They're absorbing it through their skin and they're just dying from hand sanitizer. Bleaches and hand sanitizer are one of the largest destruction of mankind there is. I'm the youngest of eight kids. I got one sister who is a neat, clean freak. She's older than I am now. She spends all day in her retirement driving her kids and her grandkids to the doctors. She's got the sickest family I've ever seen. The rest of the seven kids, we all have farms, we all play in the shit. We travel the world, we touch things, we seldom wash our hands, and we never get sick. You could eat underneath her sink, off the floor. She bleaches everything. Everything is sanitized in her house. She's got the cleanest house and the face of this earth. And they're all sick all the time. We are creating a whole generation of weak people. And that's what they want. Bill Gates would like to see a one-third to one-half reduction in the number of people on this earth. You know he's committed genocide? Yes, sir. Genocide. Well, in India, he didn't commit genocide, but he killed over 400,000 people. In Africa, he actually committed genocide. There is an entire race of Afri Africans who can never have children. And once they die off, they cease to exist. They're sterile because of his malaria drug had a sterilization component in it. Okay? The drug they're trying to produce right now for this, that they're scaring everybody, that they're getting children used to having a gun pointed at their head, right. pointing at their penile gland with these temperature things. That's right, they're, they're getting you indoctrinated for destruction, okay? The guy that made the chip the way they keep the battery going on the chip is they have to put it in one of two places where the temperature changes the most. Right there in the hand or right there in the forehead. Can't put it in their forehead because everybody will see it and it'll look ugly. So they're gonna put it right here in your hand. And the natural temperature change of your, this part of your hand keeps the battery going. You'll be able to walk up and pay for things with your hand. Gosh, you see the employees at that Wisconsin company lining up to get a chip? Take the mark of the beast in your hand. Read what it says about that in the Bible. And you go straight to hell. There ain't no forgiveness for that sin. It says it right in the Bible. Okay.
Don't do it. Defend your family, your family's life. It's their salvation. Eternal salvation is at stake. Okay? All right, I feel like a preacher. I don't mean to be a preacher, but that's what tends to happen with this.